Can the folks online here? Yes. Great, thank you. So we are going to call to order the March uh, meeting of the Delaware County Dues on Protection Board of Managers. I uh, just want to recognize that our chair, Kevin Devon, is So the chair. So we're going to ask folks who were online to introduce yourselves if you can. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance at the same time. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. The indivisible, the liberty and justice for all. So we're going to have our first round of public comment. Um, reminding folks that you're going to have three minutes. We ask that you give your name and address before you give your comments to the board. And yeah, floor is open. And also a reminder that public comment at this stage should be uh, directed at agenda items. Thank you. Um, Mary T. Austin, 1036 First Avenue, Media PA, 19063. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been just about a year since the doors of the Juvenile Detention Center closed due to negligence, physical, sexual abuse confirmed by the grand jury report. And there's no guarantee, even as compassionate as you all are, that by the time a facility is built, that you will be able to have oversight and guarantee that the youth there will be safe and cared for. I urge you to look at the Juvenile Task Force recommendations, um, and a facility is not one of them. I urge you to consider taking this time to form your own commission to make sure that Delaware County is in line with their recommendations. Uh, there is no legal requirement to have a facility, only rooms where youth will be held safely. That could be any number of townhouses in this community until we have a better way to make sure that our youth are safe I think that would be a better use of all of our time. Um, the community has spoken. You've gone out to the community. You've heard their voices. Um, we've all taken the time to come here and let you know how we feel about this. And so I just urge you again, if we're thinking forward, to not go back and do the same thing. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing expecting different results. Thank you. If not, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from February. So moved. Aye. 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 <clears throat> um, we'll have a report from our juvenile court information. Good evening, everyone. Kirsten Fitzsimmons, Delaware County Juvenile Court and Probation Services. We currently have one male and one female at Jefferson County, Ohio. One is a direct file. We have two direct file females at Abraxas Morgantown and one direct file male at Abraxas Morgantown in a borrowed bed. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Questions from the board? No. Okay. We will get a report from the superintendent and we will have a seat. Thank you, Co-Chair Williams, members of the board. Uh, first half of my pre my presentation today consists of um, a, pre a present out quarterly present out from an agency that we've 
hire to really look into <clears throat> alternatives and, and other routes for young people here in the county. Uh, as Ms. Austin stated in her comments, we went out to the community and we heard folks and a lot of what we heard was, you know, folks want folks want uh, proactive programming, right? And I think we, we, we recognize that very early on. Uh, we've contracted uh, this particular agency to really take a deep dive and assessment of our current system, our current policies, our current programs, uh, and help us as a team uh, kind of rally around the thought of being proactive uh, and helping young people in their times of deed. Um, so before us today, uh, we have interim executive director, Jason Sani from the, the uh, Children's Law, the, the, the Center of Children's Law and Policy, uh, Mrs. Molly Cook, uh, executive director of the National Assessment Center, uh, and Mrs. Amory Ambrose, uh, who is a Stony Fellow who is assigned to this project on the ground, helping us coordinate these efforts. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn away to Mr. Zanni uh, to start with a, somewhat of a high level overview of this project and give an update of where we are. Jason. Thanks so much, Mr. Irizarian. Um, thank you, uh, board members, for um, allowing us space on your agenda today um, for this topic. And certainly understand we're not the only agenda item, so we're going to try to keep this um, brief. Um, and I'm going to uh, share a little bit, um, as David mentioned, um, in the way of a higher level overview of what we're up to. I'm hoping I, oh, Molly, you beat me to it, um, in terms of sharing our screen. Um, although I think we need to swap the um, view. I'm seeing the um, presenter view. Um, And so as folks know, um, we, I'm Jason Zaney. Um, I uh, am with the Center for Children's Law and Policy. Uh, we're a national nonprofit um, that has uh, existed for over 15 years, um, doing work on youth justice um, system transformation and improvement. Um, we were excited um, to participate um, in this opportunity with Delaware County um, and really believe there's tremendous potential here um, uh, to do amazing work and to improve and build upon um, services that are already being provided um, that are achieving good results, but also um, make sure we're doing the very best uh, we possibly can to um, meet the needs of youth and families in Delaware County. So what um, I'm going to do um, at the outset, and I know we have space for questions, is um, kind of provide an overview of what we have been working on uh, since we were awarded the um, the RFP back in December, um, and of what we've achieved to date, and then also where we're headed, and some of the things we think are um, needed um, uh, urgent priorities um, in the coming months. Um, I will say at the outset, our focus and the focus of um, our work um, is really looking at the front end of the system and doing everything that can possibly be done to keep young people from having contact with the youth legal system. Um, and while that doesn't speak to issues specifically around um, secure detention or the need for out of home placement, um, in the county, there's obviously a connection. Um, and we're really, again, focusing on um, what more can be done um, at the very front end of the system, again, to reduce the need for any kind of out-of-home placement um, in the first place. And I'll share just a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing recently um, that I think shows the potential and the impact of um, doing that and um, you know, the impact that that has on on race equity um, within the youth legal system. So Molly, if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. So um, in our proposal, um, and as part of this initiative, um, we have been just uh, really privileged to have amazing partners. My organization, um, the Center for Children's Law and Policy, um, has taken the lead on coordinating the effort, but we also have um, Anne-Marie Ambrose, who is a visiting fellow from the Stonely Foundation, 
um, who uh, is has been on the ground meeting with folks in Delaware County, has tremendous expertise. I know she'll share uh, some more about her role, but it's really an amazing um, opportunity to have a fellow from the Stonely Foundation involved in this capacity. I know that um, Shay Belchick, um, another um, Stonely Fellow, has been working with Delaware County, working with the courts and probation um, and the child welfare system on youth who are involved um, in multiple systems, including the education system. And I think it's just really amazing that there's, there's been such um, a high level of investment um, by the foundation in Delaware County. And I think it's a reflection of the potential that we all see um, to do some really transformative work. Molly Cook um, with the National Assessment Center Association um, uh, is a partner in this work. Um, they're an amazing organization looking at uh, building out community-based alternatives and um, more efficient and effective responses to young people and families um, who need um, support and who would benefit from additional support. And then we have an amazing um, data partner in this project, um, Impact Solutions. They have been one of the Annie E. Casey Foundation's leading partners around use of data in the juvenile justice system. They have done um, really amazing work as part of J the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative nationally. Um, they've done amazing work within the state of Indiana. Um, and I'll share a little bit in terms of some work that they've done specifically around um, law enforcement um, and some work that we've been doing to try to identify diversion opportunities at the earliest possible point. So we're privileged to have these partners on board. Um, we're taking a um, multi-pronged approach to this assessment. Um, and for those of you who've reviewed the proposal, and I know a number of the board members have, um, we're looking at data, um, we're looking at how the youth justice process works. Um, we're looking at um, existing community-based diversion programs and alternatives, and again, um, this is all with an eye towards identifying additional opportunities or expanded opportunities um, to divert youth um, to effective community-based interventions as opposed to um, having them um, directed towards the youth um, legal system in Delco. Um, and that, I think, again, has a through line to the conversation that um, I know um, the folks have been having about um, the detention center and the need for a center or not. Um, we have been conducting interviews. Um, we are going to be partnering with a community-based organization to um, help with outreach uh, to youth, families, and community members. Um, and then again, the goal of our engagement here is not to say, here's what should be done in um, Delaware County, but to identify some specifics in terms of um, what could be done um, that could enhance front end diversion opportunities um, and give the community and this board um, and the county um, kind of those options for where we see based on research, national best practices and work that is um, being done in other jurisdictions that would help, um, uh, you know, improve the way that the county um, serves uh, young people and families. Um, in Delaware County. So we have been working um, primarily on um, initial um, interviews with stakeholders, trying to get a lay of the land in uh, Delco. Um, we have a lot um, that we are hoping to get done by June, which in includes coming um, back to the board um, with uh, some high level data headlines that can help inform um, what might improve access to diversion at the front end of the system. Um, we want to make sure that we're um, prioritizing um, outreach to the community. Um, and we've had some great conversations with folks um, who are willing to partner with us on that. Um, and then again, we don't want to um, kind of just issue a report that has recommendations for what we think would work best. Um, we want to kind of lay out a menu of options 
um, based on what we've seen and what we've heard and then give um, the county and the community um, the ability to kind of determine what will work best in terms of uh, a roadmap and recommendations. Um, so that's the overall timeline we're hoping to be done um, and really have uh, preliminary recommendations by October, but um, our official engagement ends in December. And so um, a few of the things that um, we have been uh, trying to um, acknowledge, and we know that we're one piece of a very large and broader conversation around um, the youth legal system in Delaware County is um, trying to make sure that the timeline we proposed is working with the other moving pieces um, that are happening in Delaware County. So I mentioned wanting to identify um, a community partner to assist with youth and family outreach. I think we've made some good um, inroads in that regard, and we hope to firm up a partnership um, uh, very soon on that front. We know that the board made its own data request of the court and probation. Um, we also have data that we would hope to take a look at, and we didn't. We want to be efficient about this. We don't want to duplicate efforts. Um, we want to complement um, the work that the board is doing um, and the other work that is going on, including work that um, the court and probation is doing um, with other partners, including the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform. So. We've not wanted to barrel ahead um, with that. Um, but in terms of our immediate next steps, um, we are still working on interviewing stakeholders um, and um, we will be finalizing a data request, um, again, focusing on the front end of the system. Um, we will be looking at the existing asset mapping that has been done around youth service providers. Um, and then one thing I think um, we built into our proposal, and I know Molly will speak to this too, we feel like it's really important to have um, a group that can um, oversee kind of this process and um, work with us um, as we go about um, doing this. We know the board's capacity is limited, so um, we uh, had proposed uh, creating an advisory committee around, um, again, this focus on diversion and trying to um, look at opportunities at the front end. And so I think that is something we would welcome suggestions on and we will hope to be doing in the immediate future. Um, I mentioned MPAC Solutions and the um, partnership we have with them as a data partner. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but um, again, I can share information um, with the board about um, their data chops and what they've been able to do um, in other jurisdictions in which we're working. Um, one example that I wanted to share was they've been a partner with us in Monroe County, Indiana, which is uh, the uh, Bloomington is the biggest city. It's where Indiana University is located. Um, and we've been able to work with MPAC Solutions and law enforcement agencies in Monroe County to build a very um, in-depth and interactive data tool around youth interactions with law enforcement. Um, and it's been a great resource for the county. Um, it's helped bring in additional resources for diversion opportunities in the county. And this is just one um, kind of screenshot from the tool that shows kind of the, um, the heat mapping and the geo mapping that um, we're able to do because of the partnership with law enforcement. And part of MPAC's um, role was really working with law enforcement agencies to help them use their data more effectively um, and help the community use that data more effectively to identify opportunities um, to serve kids um, and to respond to um, kids um, as early as possible and as effectively as possible. Molly, if you can go to the next slide. Um, just, I love to geek out about the data. I think there's the potential to do this in Delaware County, and I think it would be really um, amazing and helpful. Um, we're able to do things um, like look by month, by day of the week, by time of day, 
um, by season, where the needs are, where um, the opportunities are, um, again, to direct resources and identify those early diversion opportunities. So that's one thing I'm hoping um, we're able to provide to Delaware County as part of our engagement that will live on after um, our work with the county. And then last but not least, um, I just wanted to share one example um, from the state of Iowa. We did intensive work um, with four different judicial districts um, back in 2018 and 2019, um, trying to look at expanding um, opportunities for diversion, pre-petition, pre-referral. Um, and we have a whole toolkit that we developed that I'm happy to share. It was um, linked to in our proposal, but um, one of the things I wanted to point out was, um, you know, we did that work, we provided some a roadmap, and then Iowa took that and ran with it, and they've gotten really great results in expanding um, pre-charge diversion. You can see on the left, um, the youth who are being served by pre-charge diversion programs in their judicial districts um, have a much lower recidivism rate. Um, and if you look on the right, um, Black youth and youth of color um, are the majority of youth who are um, benefiting from those programs. And I, I don't think I have to say that Iowa is, um, you know, not a state that's majority youth of color, um, but youth of color are tremendously overrepresented in the justice system. So it's been a win in terms of a public safety perspective and a, um, in terms of recidivism, but it's also um, an initiative that has really um, benefited youth of color in the state. So happy to talk more about that, but um, we're excited for where we're at. Thank you for everybody who's um, spent time visiting with us and we're looking forward to the work ahead. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Molly. Um, before, before Molly starts her portion, because it's a lot of information and we're probably going to get a lot more, I wanted to see whether the board members had any questions before we move forward. Okay. Oh, did you have one? It's okay. Yeah, I'm sure they'll answer it before we get to the end. Okay. All right. Molly? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Molly Cook. I am the executive director of the National Assessment Center Association. And um, I hope I'm going to start just by providing an overview of what assessment centers are. And hopefully by the end, um, which I'll try not to take too much time, I will wrap into how we're connected to CCLP um, and the work that um, Anne Marie will be doing there in Delaware County. Um, assessment centers are not new. Uh, they were developed in the mid 90s through the support of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP, and have really um, been around over the last 30 plus years as a mechanism for communities to intervene early and divert youth from the justice system. Um, through the last 30 years of kind of evolution, they, they traditionally were starting off really kind of um, early intervention and have moved to diversion and to prevention. Um, and so you'll see there's over 100 assessment centers now throughout the country, and they call themselves different things. So when I say assessment center, I'm, I'm talking, you might not see that terminology in a name. They are referred to as diversion centers, prevention centers, uh, youth and family resource centers, connection centers, or none of the above to make the um, make it even muddier. Some of them are culturally named um, by the community. So you have the front porch in Savannah, Georgia, the harbor in Las Vegas. Um, but really what we look for at the association is that they're following the core components and the best practices within the assessment center framework. So uh, generally speaking, when we talk about an assessment center, we're talking about a community's mechanism to prevent and divert youth from the justice system. Um, and child welfare system through what we call a single point of contact. You can also think of that as a single point of access, right? So the community has come together to define um, a youth, youth in a specific target population um, are accessing the assessment center as a single point of access. Um, and the assessment center, then their function or one of the main uh, roles that they have is to identify what are what are the drivers of the behavior, what are the underlying issues that we see both from the youth and the family, 
um, and partnering with youth and families to access individualized resources or services in the in the community. So I underline partnering there. Um, it's not the assessment center telling youth and families what they need. It's youth and families telling the assessment center what they need and really figuring out um, what services in the community are going to best meet those needs. That is um, one reason when we get asked who operates an assessment center, uh, that varies all around the country. You have it ran by county government um, or a municipality, or you have nonprofit assessment centers. So it really is dependent on um, how communities structure their assessment centers, um, but they are not service providers. Uh, because they are the connector to services in a community, they are more of a neutral entity um, that is working with youth and families to figure out what are the best services in a community that are going to meet their needs. So with that, um, I like to say assessment centers have two functions. One is the connector and one is the convener. Uh, so that connector function is getting youth and families connected to community-based supports. Um, in an effort to divert them or prevent them from justice or child welfare system involvement. And the other one is to convene. Um, and that means convening community, convening system stakeholders um, to, to do a couple different things. When you are a single point of access, by bringing, um, by convening community and system stakeholders, you can make the best use or have discussion around how to make the best use of your existing resources in a community, right? We know that this already exists. How do we really leverage that as the connector and make sure youth and families are getting to the right services and supports? And as you're convening that conversation, you're simultaneously identifying what are the gaps, right? And so the assessment center really has the ability to not only leverage what's already available in a community, but identify what's not there. What do we not have in a community that um, we need to, I, to meet youth and family needs? Um, so when we looked, I, I just always like to use this visual because I'm a visual person. Um, I, assessment centers are oftentimes referred to as off ramps to the justice system, right? Um, and if you look at assessment centers all around the country, how they serve as off ramps varies widely. You have some that are more on this prevention end, um, working with schools and having youth and families self refer all the way to, you know, police um, off ramps, either as a pre arrest um, diversion mechanism or um, working with the courts um, for kind of further down the system, post-arrest or pre-adjudication diversion. And really where a community determines to have the assessment center serve as the off-ramp is data-driven, which ties back to Jason's um, and you know how we're collecting data and getting a better sense of what is currently happening and where are the opportunities in Delaware County to place an assessment center um, as an off-ramp to the justice system. One thing that I just wanna quickly mention is I say place an assessment center. Um, assessment centers can be bricks and mortar, can be mobile, um, can have satellite sites, or can have a hybrid of all of, all of the above, right? Um, so it's it uh, can be a bricks and mortar where youth and families either are, um, law enforcement is bringing youth to that center and the assessment center is then working to get those youth and families connected. Um, it could be a mechanism where they have that and they also have satellite sites in the community where they're engaging youth and families on a more voluntary or appointment-based um, mechanism. So there are different ways to do this and different models all across the country that have shown to be um, impactful. It just depends on local community need, which is why we're going through this needs assessment first to figure out what, uh, you know, where the best opportunity is for Delaware County. The one community that I want to call out that is likely the most similar model that Delaware County would be exploring um, is the multi-agency resource center in Calcasieu Parish, Louisiana, who has, we call it the MARC for short, for short. Um, but they have been open since about 2011, but they had a study done in 2014 and another one done in 2022. Um, and really, I think this shows the impact of, uh, that an assessment center can make um, in the justice system uh, makeup, right? So since opening, their petitions have dropped 45%, their detention placements have dropped 58%. 
status referrals to the court have dropped almost in half, um, and their delinquency diversions have increased um, by almost 35%. So really, when we're talking about keeping kids out of detention, out of the courts, and facilitating access to community-based supports, um, this is one that you know I think is a really uh, impactful center and one that is run by a, um, a county that um, or a parish in Louisiana, so they call them. Just two other quick slides here, and I'll let Annie take it. Um, but for us to figure out where the assessment center sits in that off ramp for Delaware County, what we do um, at the association and what we're partnering with CCLP and Annie to do um, is to better understand how are youth and families coming in contact to the, with the system now? Um, what does that pathway to the to the system look like? What are the different decision points? What are the available options? Um, and we use that through data and stakeholder interviews to develop quite literally a map from the NAC um, perspective. We actually put up a visual map to show um, where those opportunities are. Um, we cannot do that without creating an advisory or imp implementation board, right? Um, and one that is multidisciplinary in nature. So youth and families that have been, been impacted by the system need to be at the table. Um, all your system stakeholders, your community stakeholders, um, to really inform this work moving forward. And um, again, understanding what's available in the communities with the assessment center being responsible for connecting youth and families, they need to know what's what is available. Um, and of course, building and sustainability there for the assessment center. So that's really what we're working on at this point with CCLP is better understanding what is current practice and where are opportunities for um, an off-ramp and how that assessment center can be integrated into Delaware County's plans. So Annie, I don't know if you wanna take it from there and kind of talk about uh, your role with the Stonely Fellow or Marie, if you want me to hand it back to you, but. Real quick, because I know we're over time. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Anne-Marie Ambrose. I am now officially a Stonely Fellow. Um, so the Stonely Foundation is a foundation in Philadelphia that I did a lot of work with in the past. Um, they have an excellent reputation for funding leaders to do system change in um, young people's lives. So work with systems to really think differently about opportunities to transform those systems to benefit young people. Um, just a little bit of, in way of background, um, I started my career as a public defender. I spent 13 years as a public defender in Philadelphia, mostly representing young people. Um, then went on to run detention and all of the juvenile services for the city of Philadelphia. The Notorious Youth Study Center was my responsibility when I was there. Um, after that, I went to the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and worked um, over the youth detention, the youth development centers, and then got um, when there was a horrible death in Philadelphia, was asked to take over child welfare at the state level as well, and then was recruited by Mayor Nutter to come and be his DHS commissioner. And I was there for over six years. The last eight years I've actually spent at a national foundation, kind of looking at what do other places do? Because I only knew Philadelphia, I knew the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And now I'm coming full circle. And um, with the Stonely Foundation, I had to pitch my fellowship. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because of a lot of these, the people in the room and the people that you've heard from today. Um, I think there's an amazing opportunity for transformation with youth justice in Delaware County. I think you have new leadership. I think you have committed politicians. I think you have really invested community members. And I think we need to take advantage of the national um, leaders that you've brought here. So one of the reasons that both CCLP and NAC are important to me and is their methodology. They really use what I've come to believe after almost 35 years in this business, the voices of youth, families, and communities as the best data to inform solutions to the problems they're experiencing. So I really appreciate the community members who have come and talked about this. I do have a bias, but it's based on research and it's based on data. And that locking kids up when we don't need to is more detrimental to both them and to the communities that they live in. And so You've heard the methodology that Jason and, um, and Molly are going to use. All of you can be a part of that. And all of us, I think, want the same thing. And so my job is to be coordinating things on the ground, listening to people, and really bringing what we're hearing from community voice, from young people's voice, from parents' voice into the planning process. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to, I guess, David. 
Thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to entertain questions. Can we move forward, data, or do you want to move into the presentation? Do we have any board members that have any questions specific to our partnership with CCLP? I did have a few questions for Molly in her section. Um, Molly, just looking at the assessment and prevention centers, um, are they typically in the community that they serve? Or are they usually like trying to be embedded in an area where you might see more youth impacted in that area of the county? Um, I would, so, it really depends on what community that you're looking at, right? Um, you see assessment centers, <coughs> excuse me, that have satellite sites um, within the community. Like I said, it might have, um, you know, kind of a, a bricks and mortar location. Um, you have, especially when you're looking at in urban areas where, or an assessment center that is serving a, a smaller a uh, geographic area, you might just have a bricks and mortar. Um, and you see in rural communities where there's no bricks and mortar and, uh, you know, it's all kind of satellite remote work. So it really depends, which I think is the beauty of the assessment center framework is that it can be adapted to local community needs. Um, but we, you know, we definitely want to make it accessible to youth and families when we can. Thank you. Um, and then I guess uh, talking about the different models for those who are uh, referring individuals to an assessment center, have you seen a model where um, it's a mixed model of referrals? So coming from police, coming from the DA, coming from schools, coming from community and you have seen that. Okay. Just yeah. Wondering. Yeah. So, and I, I'm sorry, I should have probably, when I had that visual up, I should explain that in some communities, it's one off-ramp, one decision point, right? It's it's um, a police uh, partnership where the assessment center um, sits. In other communities, it's just prevention. And in the center that I used to run in Colorado, we sat in all of those. Um, and as we evolved, we added more off-ramps to the assessment center um, and served schools, but also served police, but also served courts. Um, so it's not a, you know, pick one and that's the lane that you stay in. Um, you really can develop multiple partnerships to influence that, that single point of access. Thank you. Yeah. Any other yeah, so yeah, I had a quick question, which I was wanted to hear a little bit more about the involvement of both the courts, law enforcement, school probation in your process of determining what needs are and what what are the needs so we i know we're talking about the community portion of it um but there's also a systematic portion of it and how does that fit into what you guys are doing i think that might be pretty <laughs> i can take that um so i think um we uh, as molly and annie mentioned i think um we really do prioritize and you know i think we, you know, we wore this on our sleeve and the response to the RFP in that we feel like young people um, and family members and community members um, have um, just not been adequately represented in efforts to look at, um, you know, what, where the gaps are, where the needs are. So um, I think that's part of why we built in um, the outreach and the intentionality around partnerships that we did. That said, um, you know, CCLP and the NAC um, and Annie, um, we all work with systems every day. That is the bread and butter of our work. And we know that there has to be a partnership with law enforcement, um, with probation, with the courts, and their perspective matters tremendously. So um, it's not just we're going to them to ask for data. It's we also want to hear, you know, what what um, what is working and what is not on the ground. Going back to the example that I shared um, of our uh, the law enforcement data tool that we developed in Monroe County, Indiana, with our data partner, one of the reasons the law enforcement agencies in that county agreed to do it was because they felt like they wanted more options to deal with things that they were spending a ton of time on um, that uh, they felt like could be handled more efficiently and more effectively. And it was really helpful to hear anecdotally what that looked like, but then being able to marry that with 
the actual data of here's what's happening on the ground. Um, and then also include the perspective of young people and community members. Um, all of that together, I think, gives us the most comprehensive um, perspective and the most accurate um, assessment of what's actually happening and where there is the greatest potential to improve on what um, is already being done. So I think um, Annie and Molly, um, you know, please add, but I think we consider those partnerships essential. All of this is interconnected. And I love the um, the graphic that Molly had up with the off ramps. I mean, you saw all of the different um, child serving entities and agencies and partners um, that are involved in um, the youth legal system and young people who come into contact with the law. And this can't be done um, by ignoring, you know, or elevating the perspective of, you know, one over the other. I think all of those um, perspectives matter. But Annie, Molly, please. Yeah, I'll just add that we've already met with a number of the system leaders. We've met with Danielle and her team in the court. We've met with, with Katie, and um, we're getting ready to meet with more of the, the public defenders. I think that the court is a critical partner in this, and a lot of that is based on the structure of Pennsylvania. And um, they've been doing some, here's some leading some forums where we get to learn about what exists. Part of the role of CCLP and NAC and myself is to say, okay, what doesn't exist? What are the assets in the community that we could be supporting in ways that are prevention for young people so that they don't get arrested, so that they don't have to ever go into detention? And so that is a huge aspect that we want to do. But really, our my job is to work with anybody who has anything to say about this to help create the better solution. And I think that people who are closest to the problem can come up with the better solutions. And so we really have to do a lot of listening. Um, but the partnership, especially with the board and probation, is really critical. And then schools and law enforcement, for sure. Um, I'm going to ask folks to... Uh, come up to the mic when you speak. I'm not sure. Did folks online hear all of that? <laughs> so just one one additional question, um, and that was around, I uh, think, Jason, you mentioned um, formation of an advisory committee as being um, part of the best practice. At what point does that fall into play? Is that after your full assessment, or is that something that is put into place as part of the assessment, or where, where does that where does that fall in? I think that's it's a great question. Um, our experience is that um, uh, it's better to do it um, earlier because it informs kind of the questions that get asked and just generates um, more buy-in. Um, and I think it enriches the process. I will tell you, we've done assessments where we've kind of parachuted in and made recommendations and then left and. Um, but we've also had engagements where we really did work to build um, an advisory committee that brought that diverse array of perspectives. And I think our experience, um, and I'll let you know Molly share her experience, our experience is the, the end product um, is much better. It's much more inclusive. Um, um, and there's more sustainability. It doesn't, you know, just kind of fade away. You don't issue a report and then have it sit on a shelf and nothing happens. You have a group of folks who feel like they they're invested in really making things happen. Um, and so our you know our preference would be to convene a group sooner um, than later. And we would welcome you know suggestions for um, who to include in that group. And you guys are taking the lead on that. You're, you're already working towards that. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, and we, we've started thinking about that brainstorming. So if anyone um, has ideas, we'd love to hear it. And the idea is to form an implementation team initially that's broader in scope than maybe even the board so we can include all those perspectives that we want to include. And then that would inform an advisory team that would be responsible for making sure that this stays because leaders come and go, but community stays. And so how do we sustain the efforts over time? Any other questions from board members online in the room? Sure. No, I just want to thank Jason, Molly, and, and Anne Marie for their leadership. And I'm very excited about the national team that we have at the table and, and what we're able what we're going to be able to accomplish together, right? And the reality is this um at some point in time, uh there will be a center here. Um, but 
you know, there's there is a X amount of time in which we have to be proactive, right? We can't wait around uh, hoping that uh, yeah, I'm an offensive guy. So we have to be proactive here. And I think a lot of what we're doing here uh, is getting a baseline assessment of what we need uh, and having a strategic plan collectively with all departments on how we move forward and how we help kids uh, uh, essentially divert them from the system. Um, on the other hand, I'm very proud of our board members, of those who have uh, been a part of our design subcommittee. Um, and that's a perfect seg segue into having our architect, Mr. Bob Reed, aboard. And he's going to go through a bit of a comprehensive design in which we come, uh, we've come we come together uh, to create. Uh, if you remember, we've asked Bob to look at kind of three different options. And one of them would be, you know, if he can retrofit our hopes and needs in the current existing center. Uh, the second would be if he can uh, reserve parts of the building with some additions. And then today he's going to speak a bit about more of uh, what we asked him to look to in, in detail, which is a total demolition of uh, the current center uh, and what it looks like um, in, in uh, completely new in the existing site. So I'm going to defer to Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Azari. Uh, is it possible to put the presentation up on the board? And that's the last slide. So if we could go to the beginning, I appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm Bob Reed, uh, architect with Spiesel Architectural Group in Springfield. The, um, so as Mr. Rosari had uh, indicated at, uh, at previous meetings in uh, culminating in December, we had uh, showed uh, some design uh, solutions looking at uh, renovation in addition to the existing juvenile detention center. Uh, at that time, it, uh, with the program that was being requested, it didn't uh, fit within the existing juvenile uh, detention center. So it was something that uh, was we were really required to look at additions to the existing facility. Uh, from that point forward, at that meeting, we were asked to look at uh, uh, what would it uh, look like in cost to uh, to de demolish the existing facility and, and build new. So that's what I'm going to uh, bring you through today. Next uh, slide, please. So we're going to be showing uh, building plans and site plans. So then the uh, in the building plans we're going to show you, it's going to be a matter of uh, the uh, uh, secure side uh, uh, being built uh, independently, as well as looking at a scenario where there's the secure side and the non-secure side, a, a resource center uh, being built at the same time or potentially in the future. And then we'll uh, have a cost estimate uh, related to that. And then also looking at a timeline if uh, if there, we were to start moving forward soon. Thank you. You can move to the next slide. So something that uh, was talked about uh, back in uh, that was presented back uh, last year in terms of project mission statement, looking at why are why are we here and what would we gauge success of this project against? Uh, and if I could read that, Delaware County aspires to create a new building for the juvenile detention center at the Lima campus that represents and reflects the values of the county as they strive to create a positive environment that protects our youth and community while simultaneously fulfilling a fervent belief that our youth are capable of and deserve the opportunity to receive support to be happy and contributing members of our society. Uh, and in uh, big letters, don't go halfway. Next uh, slide, please. So in supporting points to that, looking at a, uh, we were instructed to look at a multi-purpose facility for prevention, detention, and rehabilitation, reflect the best pra practices of trauma-informed care. Uh, and also really critical here was parental community and partner involvement uh, in the uh, uh, in in uh, working with the uh, the youth that uh, may be in the system. The impression of this uh, facility should be modern, supportive, and academic, as opposed to what uh, exists currently. Uh, make sure that we meet the re licensing requirements of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and uh, looking at balancing initial and long term fiscal responsibility, and make sure that we're spending dollars wisely, but also making sure that if, uh, creating a facility uh, that will be able to be more easily uh, maintained and for the long run, for the long run. And then also uh, looking at sustainable buildings so that uh, our footprint on the uh, on the land would be less. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is uh, a lot of detail here, but something that we uh, we reviewed with this uh, uh, this board previously in terms of how 
the uh, facility was going to be operated uh, on the secure side and the non-secure uh, resource side. Um, and basically the, the change from the previous uh, discussions was a matter of where the secure intake entry in this program diagram would happen. The existing juvenile detention center has the secure intake directly adjacent to the visitor entry to the building. Uh, so that uh, uh, since we are looking at a new facility, it gives us an opportunity to look at uh, separating those, uh, those entries. Uh, which would be good for the perception of the uh, facility for uh, folks visiting. Next slide, please. So the uh, this is if you can see the property line uh, the uh, around the perimeter of this uh, of this sheet. Uh, that's the the land that the uh, that is owned by Delaware County. That also includes uh, Fair Acres to the left. Uh, the emergency uh, services building directly adjacent to the juvenile detention center, as well as land to the uh, to the right uh, that is leased uh, by Miramont uh, facility that uh, next door. So if you go to the next slide that that zooms in a bit. So understanding there's a, a lot of land there, but they uh, looking at uh, where a facility uh, would make sense to be located. Uh, the uh, uh, the blue ovals are the areas that make sense in terms of where a building could be located, which allows us to move it uh, away from the uh, existing emergency services building, but the uh, but also uh, have a, a situation where we, we're not moving any the building any closer to the residential neighborhood uh, directly adjacent. Um, and the uh, in, w the reason for the two uh, blue ovals with a red dash line in between, there's a, actually a lease line on the property that the land to the to the right of that uh, red dash line is actually leased by uh, Miramont. So if there's an ability to uh, renegotiate that lease line, uh, then the the blue oval to the right would be able to be uh, an area that we could uh, uh, help to uh, locate the building or where we could locate the uh, the building or part of the building. And all the blue arrows are actually showing directions of the way water runs off of this site currently. So, so being uh, closer to the top is uh, is uh, logical in terms of how stormwater management would work on this site. If you look at the green on the lower right hand side, that's an existing stormwater. Uh, 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 really, the, the direction that that the, uh, the the stormwater runs currently on this site. So, respecting that and understanding how do we work with that is be important in terms of how to have an effective stormwater management system while also uh, keeping costs uh, minimized as uh, much as possible. And the uh, arrow, red arrows um, are showing a potential circulation of vehicles around the facility. The uh, uh, the one to the uh, to the right is showing uh, coming out to 352, which is the uh, double dash line on the bottom of the screen. Uh, so they uh, providing a new access into 352 from uh, from the uh, facility would be something that could be uh, safer in terms of how, how uh, vehicles uh, enter and exit the uh, the site. And then the double ended uh, red line is showing its uh, circulation for vehicles between the emergency services building and the new facility, which would be we recommend in terms of having this the circulation remain on the uh, around the uh, the new center as opposed to extending to the left. The arrow to the left goes around the emergency services building, but we think it would be wise to to not mix the uh, vehicular traffic of those two facilities. We can move to the next slide, please. So this gives an aerial from uh, further north on 352, looking back towards the existing facility. Uh, as you can see, the, the kind of the gully uh, the, uh, to the left, where you can see some uh, some growies there. That's where that uh, where I said that stormwater uh, runs currently. So it would be a matter of looking at how do we respect that and improve it to uh, make sure that uh, it meets current code. And the next slide would actually would show what a view is for, uh, aerially from the uh, from the neighborhood uh, to the west of the uh, uh, existing facility and something that we want to keep in mind in terms of not going any uh, closer to the neighbors that are there and potentially uh, move further away uh, from from that neighborhood. Okay. So this shows uh, a site plan uh, with uh, 352 off to the right and the uh, this shows uh, the site plan shows uh, the full um, build out of the non-secure side and these uh, and the uh, in the secure side. The green uh, on the right-hand side of that plan, uh, with the boxes for the floor plan, are, is the uh, uh, is the non-secure resource center, and then uh, to the uh, kind of the boomerang shaped uh, building that extends uh, up on the plan from there, and then to the upper left is the uh, secure side, which what that does is allow us to 
have the uh, non-secure side, the more uh, academic looking part of this uh, project facing out towards 352. So we have uh, the uh, the impression that was requested in terms of more of an academic building as opposed to uh, something that might be seen as a detention center. And then to the left of the building uh, with a blue dash line, that's the outdoor recreation area uh, for the secure side. And the uh, green area to the upper right of the, the green boxes, that's the exterior uh, uh, recreation area for the non-secure resource center. So what this would do is allow folks to come in off of 352 and, and uh, get directly to uh, the uh, non-secure uh, resource center or move around to the right and go to the entry to, of the, uh, um, of the um, secure side. And if you were to continue all the way uh, to the top of that screen and then take a left down to where the, the blue boxes are, uh, that's the sally port for the uh, secure intake into the building. And in looking at this in terms of the size of the of the project, if you could go back uh, one slide, please. The um, so the total of this uh, entire uh, facility is uh, uh, approximately forty nine thousand square feet, which which is uh, uh, about the same as the existing uh, secure facility. So in essence, what's happening here is the secure side is re being reduced by fifteen thousand square feet, and then the non secure side would be that would take up that fifteen thousand square feet. So in essence, we're getting the fifteen thousand square foot non-secure resource center that fits within the existing square footage uh, that the uh, the the uh, existing Joomla detention center um, uh, took up. So what it is, is a much more efficient building. It's uh, smaller, uh, 15,000 square foot uh, uh, smaller than the existing building because we're able to right size the spaces uh, because there's uh, we're, we're planning this facility for 24 uh, bedrooms as opposed to the existing facility that was planned for 66. If we can go to the next slide, please. And so then as we go closer into this plan, and if the next slide will get us uh, even closer in, if we could uh, do one more. And this is this is the both the uh, secure and non-secure side uh, coming together. So it, on the uh, right-hand side of that plan, uh, in the green, that's the entry into the, the non-secure resource center. So you come into the TAN area, which is this uh, student lounge and uh, open uh, cafe area that then has access into uh, classrooms and resource uh, areas, um, uh, recreation spaces, uh, a, a barber shop uh, for one person, a, uh, a music studio for one or uh, or two people. So, having something that we have easy access to a lot of resources that uh, could happen there. Uh, again, to look at uh, prevention uh, and rehabilitation in this uh, facility. And then, if you were to look on the left hand side of that same plan, if we could stay on that same plan, please. The uh, Thank you. And then you see in the, the light blue to the left of the green, that's the kitchen that's uh, shared by both the sides of the facility, uh, dining area that uh, uh, that looks out to the uh, to the green courtyard uh, to the left, and the uh, uh, the blue to the left of that, the deeper blue is uh, recreation spaces uh, that uh, that can be used by the the uh, the folks in the uh, secure side of the facility. Then, if we can go to the next slide, it moves further up in the left to this uh, floor plan. So then. Uh, the upper right hand, basically to the right of the red boxes there, that's the entry into the uh, secure side of the facility for uh, visitors uh, into the facility. So then folks would come in there, go into a, a secure lobby, be able to talk to somebody and uh, be directed in terms of who uh, who will be coming out to to bring them into the facility, which they would be brought over to the red, uh, the red boxes onto the right, which are interview rooms, a uh, uh, a chapel uh, courtroom, if if uh, if uh, required, uh, and also some um, some resource uh, offices there. So then, folks would come in to see the the person that in the facility that they were coming to see, whether it's uh, parents, uh, lawyers, whoever uh, would be coming in to see folks, and then they would exit out the way that they uh, came into the facility. If you go look up the uh, far left, uh, that's where the the uh, uh, the medium blue color is. That's the intake. For the facility, so the the gray part that extends out to the uh, upper left is the sally port, so that uh, so that uh, vehicles can come into the facility uh, and drop off uh, a youth into the uh, facility. The uh, and then they would go through the uh, the blue area, which is the uh, the intake uh, area for the facility, and the pink area is the medical suite uh, for the facility, which was requested to be directly adjacent to the um, to the intake side of the of the facility. 
as you would continue down the, the corridor that moves from the upper left to the lower right, the, uh, on the, the purple side are uh, eight bedroom uh, pods. So then there's a series of three of them so that there's an opportunity for the counselor uh, who would be working with the youth in that uh, in each of those pods to have uh, their their office located there, have uh, visual access over the uh, over the area, have mediation spaces throughout the facility that would have easy access for uh, for uh, for folks if they need to uh, um, uh, to have a little bit of extra help and a little bit of separation from from others if they were having uh, some challenges on that day. As you see, the bedrooms they, they are V-shaped. They extend out. The day rooms uh, take advantage of nice views out uh, outside and and. Uh, uh, and light coming into the facility. The existing facility uh, doesn't, doesn't do that quite honestly. There's very little natural light that comes into the existing facility. What we wanna do is make sure that we have a lot of natural light uh, 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 coming into the facility as well as the views uh, looking out, just much more uh, pleasant in terms of wellness for, uh, for the, uh, the folks that are gonna be in this facility, whether, whether it's the youth or the, uh, the staff that are uh, working there. On the other side of that, um, of that uh, tan card or in the uh, light purple, those are our uh, classrooms uh, there, uh, computer labs. Uh, so having access uh, um, on one side to the classrooms, the other side to the residential pods, uh, so that it's, it's those, those uses are closer to each other in terms of during the day that there's easy access back and forth between those, those facilities. So then that is the that's the makeup of the the uh, the, the uh, building that is all unified between the secure and, and the non-secure resource center. We go to the next slide, then uh, that will show if we this were to be built at uh, in two phases, with the the uh, secure side being built first. This is showing how that facility would still uh, work. It's still uh, the secure side still works the way that uh, that it did in the previous plan. It's really just a matter of the green part of the uh, of the building on the right hand side, which was the non secure resource center. Uh, it's not shown there currently, but then the the uh, roadways work uh, the same as they did previously to be able to have uh, access into the all the necessary entries and exits out of the out of the facility. Uh, so then we still you know take advantage of um, of the, the the ability to build this. Uh, first, if that if the county chooses to do that and wait uh, later to build the uh, uh, the secure the non secure resource center, and then if you next slide would show the um, just that tie. It, it actually, if you could go one more, so then uh, it just shows that when the non secure side uh, is not there, then it's still that would be the, uh, uh, the the entire facility. So then the next this, the non secure side would would tie into. Uh, into like a piece of the puzzle into this uh, if it were to be built at a later date. Okay. So this shows just in terms of looking at uh, inspirational images, uh, this is a middle school actually that, that our firm just uh, completed in Lower Marion School District, uh, something that's uh, academic looking. And uh, we see that, you know, from the direction that we've received and and also in terms of how the, the facility operates, we we feel that we can have, have something that looks uh, very academic and allows us to get uh, natural light in and out of uh, the facility. And then if we were go to the next slide, shows a, a community center that, that I was involved with in North uh, Jersey, something that uh, colorful and, and, uh, uh, and pleasant, but still having a, a good opportunity to get light into the facility uh, and views around the facility to make sure uh, that, uh, that there's a, a good opportunity for staff to, uh, uh, to uh, be in contact with the, uh, with the youth that are in the facility. Next slide, please. So then as we were looking at the cost estimate, uh, we looked at it at uh, two different options here with option one being uh, built all at one time. So with a, uh, in this case, the demolition of the existing facility is included in that number. Um, so then uh, as we we're shown there, $426,000, including design costs, uh, all these are all in costs uh, that, that include uh, design fees, uh, soft costs, uh, furniture, fixture, equipment, security, uh, that would be necessary. So we show there in terms of how uh, that could total $37.5 million uh, total with the secure side being 26.4, understanding that you would, if you were only to build the secure side, you would also have to do the 426,000 for the, the demolition. And then what we looked at was option two is a phased option where the non-secure side would be built uh, later, approximately uh, 2026 to 27. Uh, so there's 
approximately a, a two and a half million dollar uh, uh, increase in cost there. And the uh, and the reason being is uh, escalation, just in terms of that uh, you know every as we know in, in many parts of our lives, the, the longer that you wait to buy something, the prices continue to go up. But also, it would be a whole separate project, so then you would have to bid out the project separately, uh, and the uh, and then um, have a new contractor come in to do to build the rest of the facility, uh, which which does present some challenges because you're building a, a facility right next to an existing facility. It gets done. It's just a matter of something that needs to be kept in mind uh, in terms of building uh, building this in a phased out uh, situation. So and that's what that asterisk shows in terms of the non secure side. Um, the, uh, in terms of looking at that's where the major part of the cost is. There is a slight cost that we're showing different uh, uh, differential that we're showing between the secure side and both scenarios at 26.4 million for the option one to 26.9. And the thinking there is the, the wall between the secure and non-secure side, uh, in, if you build it all at one time is the interior wall. If we uh, build it separately, then that outside wall becomes, uh, or that, that, that wall becomes an outside wall and there's additional costs that would be uh, incurred in, in doing that. And then I can go to the um, to the next slide, which shows in terms of uh, timeline. Of course, we can go back and answer any questions um, after we're done this. So, so looking at finalizing our feasibility study, which basically in this in this month we're finalizing that. Uh, then looking at um, the uh, full design and land development from uh, April this year to June of next year. Uh, and as was brought up in previous meetings, the uh, uh, just the architectural design and engineering design of the building itself uh, wouldn't quite take as long as uh, that is showing, but the land development approvals uh, will take that long, uh, most likely just from experience in terms of working with the, with the local uh, authorities as well as working with the county uh, in terms of getting approvals. And then bidding and contract award looking at July to September of 2024 and then construction, what we're showing October of 24 to December of 25 uh, for the full build out with an asterisk there saying it, uh, that we could uh, save uh, probably a month of construction time if the uh, non-secure side's not built at the same time. So then that would be early November of uh, 2025 that we believe uh, you could uh, deliver just the secure side. And then looking at the secure and option two is secure as a separate phase. Uh, and the asterisk on that says, assuming design and land development done was done with option one, if it was all designed at the same time, and then you were just building at two different times, then uh, then you could go through the process like is shown there, the bidding and contract award of three months and construction at 12. If you don't design and get land development approval of that secure side or uh, of the uh, the, the non-secure side later, uh, then there would be additional time uh, and money involved with uh, designing the building and going through land development that would add uh, additional time onto that option two schedule. And that's the end of the presentation. So uh, there was a lot of information there. So I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, sorry. Can you hear me? This is Kevin. Yes, we can hear you. Bob, can you just remind uh, us all how this compares in terms of cost to the initial two options, which were to um, uh, build within the existing footprint, option one, option two being to um, do sort of a partial where you maintain some portion of the existing footprint but build, you know, out of that for the uh, community center and then so essentially how those two options from a cost perspective compared to uh um to, to the options you put before us today absolutely so um so the previous options basically are um when when we looked at uh our first charge of looking at how do we fit the uh, uh all the program that we're looking for with the secure side and the non-secure uh, resource center into the existing facility it just didn't fit the uh, and it wasn't just because of the size of the facility, it was the type of spaces that were necessary. So we did not actually, we're not able to show how the existing facility could meet the, the current need. So what we did was looked at how the existing facility with some uh, strategic additions could, could meet that need. And uh, the difference in cost, the, the uh, using the existing building with additions was approximately $3 million more expensive than uh, to knock down the existing facility and, and to build new. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, part of it is uh, greater efficiency in terms of building new versus trying to work with an old facility that that uh, may not have been designed as as good as uh, we would like for the current need. Um, but the uh, 
Um, but then also because we could right size the building, as I said in the presentation, the not the secure side is actually 15,000 square foot smaller than the existing facility. So because we were going to be working with a lot less youth going through the facility, we were able to uh, to shrink the facility substantially, which allowed us to reduce the uh, the cost. So in summary, um, the options today are cheaper than the previous options. Correct. To maintain some portion of the existing facility. And within the two options today, if you were to build in phases so as to attempt to um, prioritize the secure side, it would cost you $2 million plus more, and it would only be two months difference in terms of when the secure side would be complete versus building all in one fell swoop. Is that, is that a correct summary? Uh, that's right. In terms of the, the well, the, the cost uh, is substantially different though. If we could go back to the, the, uh, the cost slide, um, it, the uh, looking at um, if we were to, to uh, build the uh, non-secure side at the same time, then it's uh, 10.6 million. Uh, I'm sorry, but then you were, were you referring to then if we build it later, what the $2 million, $2.5 million price difference if we were to build the yeah, okay. secure side later? Uh, yes, that's that's exactly. correct. And then in terms of time, it would be two and a half million dollars more, and it would save only two months um, from the perspective of completion of the secure correct. side. Correct. Correct. Because uh, when we're building a larger facility, if we're building a thirty-five uh, or thirty thousand square foot fil facility versus forty-five, there's not exponentially more time that it takes to build that. It's a matter of larger crews that would be building the facility. So there is some difference in time, but it's not uh, appreciable. Um, for folks on the phone who have questions, if you could use the raised hand feature, we don't intuitively look at the screen. We're looking at each other in the room. So Sean will um, identify you if you raise your hand so we can know that we'll get to your question. Um, Ms. Theo? Um, just thinking um, about how the existing building has been vacant for two years and then, you know, it's obviously going to be time depending on what we choose to do. Um, are we grandfathered in for this use of the secure facility like do you foresee any issues with you you would uh you would still have to go to the to the township to get approval so the thing is you're not necessarily grandfathered in but because it's the same uh use we would expect uh, not to have uh, uh major impediments to uh to getting approval um and have there been any discussions with the township so far on uh, any of these plans we, we have not had okay. uh discussions with the township myself Okay. Ms. Diaz, our, myself, public works director, as long like resident, we actually met the township at the site and explained what we were attempting to do. And uh, we kind of, uh, you know, they just wanted to be at the table in terms of where we're going from day one. And, you know, they would help us um, as much as possible is, is what we were told. Okay. Um, and then was, uh, I guess, were the plans for the possible non-secure side also? Yeah, we, we, at, at that point in time, we had explained the entire project okay. of being a dual purpose and, uh, you know, what our intentions were. And, you know, we, it seemed like we, they were supportive. Okay, thanks. And I just want to clarify, so grandfathering in uh, refers only to the use of the land, not to licensure, right? So there right. is no grandfathering in at this point in terms of the use of the property, is that correct? That's correct. And we, we've submitted our potential license to the state. You know, they advise us, you know, we can't have, a, you know, you can't come out to conduct a site visit until you guys have a facility. So, you know, all the paperwork in terms of a potential licenses has been submitted at this point. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing you said, Bob. Um, mm -hmm. Great, we're on that slide. So if I'm looking at the agenda, it looks like option one and option two referred to there is actually referring to option three, A and B on the agenda, is that correct? That's correct. So then in terms of, uh, I'm sure in terms of how that was put together in terms of uh, as what was talked about as to using the existing facility. So uh, I apologize in terms of not uh, yeah, matching that. Yeah. I just wanted to, to be sure that folks could track what we were looking at. Correct. Um, any other questions? I do have a question, and I don't know if you're able to answer it or David or Mr. Resnick. 
Do we have any idea how much the building uh, as it is right now is costing the county with issues that have come up with the, an abandoned building, an old abandoned building? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer that. I'm not sure if the county uh, can. Um, I'll look into it and I can, get you, I can get the board a number for sure to see what we've paid, uh, at least since I've been here. You know, and all we receive is more so water bills, things of that nature. Um, we'll look into it and we'll get you a figure for sure. Pipes breaking and matters like that. Yeah, yeah pipes have broken over. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think we've actually went out and put money into the bill. Okay. And the other thing I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. we can actually have the exact years that the facility was closed. I know somebody from the public did say one year. We certainly are over one year. The doors were shut. Um, if, if I could get clarification on that uh, over two years ago. Yeah, I believe it was, it was March 2021. So the building has been abandoned since March of 2021. Is that correct? Correct. Questions from the group? So um, I, I just want to make sure that we get a sense of the uh, sentiment of the board. And it sounds like uh, option number one, as is listed on the agenda, is uh, not a starter. Is that the sense of the board? Yes. Folks yes. online? Not one. Yes. Yes. And number two, Likewise. Yes, this is like HGTV. Number three. So unless I hear otherwise, I, I'm gonna assume that the consensus of the board is that number three would be the direction um, that we might take. Uh, as between options three A and B, reflected in cost up there, is there any sense of where the points are? So I do have a comment, just um, taking into consideration uh, a lot of the community sessions that we've been at, um, some of the input that kind of requested us to try to maybe think about putting a facility or the resource center of the facility uh, closer to the community that we may be serving. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the plan, or at least how I understand it for the non-secure side is really to have the facility in the resource center and we would be bringing out our own providers and having providers in that center to provide preventative um, prevention or maybe the assessment and prevention center of some sort uh, is really the understanding that I have right now of what we're doing there. And my, my question to the group is looking at the difference in costs is $12 million, right? For the other non-secure side. If we would consider only doing phase one secure side in Lima now and look at what our options are to build maybe two potential resource centers in the community, possibly one in Chester or looking at the data, possibly one in Chester, I'd imagine maybe possibly something somewhere along Southeast Elko um, and having those centers closer to the community that they're serving versus have, being, having to bus children, families out to Lima to uh, take advantage of the resource center that's there and the services that are there. Why wouldn't we just do that within the community? Uh, so that that's kind of my question to the group um, as we think about how we're building this. And yeah, I think and and I'll turn to the Mr. Illuminari to uh, supplement or correct the data. But as as I understand it, having a non-secure site does not preclude us from having satellite locations in the community. In fact, having a nose on the side would be, as uh, Ms. Cook described, possibly a hub that then directs folks to in community services. Um, it just need not be a uh, place for folks to see services. It could be just a touch point where they're um, surprised with services they might just be closer to home. Is that, is that correct? I don't know that we've made that decision in the design committee. But I think um, the option of having a non-secure side provides us um, potentially a hub uh, for those in community services if we were to go that route. Does that sound correct? Yeah, I think first and foremost, I see value in kind of both both visions, right? Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, having a centralized location, even when we talk about, you know, we had our partners at CCLP spend a lot of time uh, kind of going through this robust kind of strategy. You know, at some point in time, we're going to have all the data that says, you know, 
you know, what, do, you know, what does community need? Um, and in my time working with nonprofits and C3s, you know, we, we're going to have to really help develop their infrastructure. And I think a potential uh, a site like this, we're able to do so on neutral ground. So we can have organizations from Chester, organizations from Darby, organizations from Yaden, et cetera, um, uh, nonprofits who are doing the work, working with our kids. You know, there's space to have them trained. There's, supposed, there's space for all of us to come together, talk about what we're doing collectively. Um, you know, so with that type of design, we're able to provide from the county perspective that technical assistance. Uh, not that we can't on satellite spaces, um, but, you know, again, in terms of my long term vision, you know, when, when we have all the data we need in terms of what young people need, uh, taking, you know, really being able to identify the C3s that are doing the works in their community and really empower them to do that prevention work. And, you know, with our community resource center, um, uh, I look at it more of as a site for intervention. You know, there's uh, 2021, there was uh, a little bit over 500 juvenile allegations, right? And only 109 of them were actually sent to detention, right? So that's 19% of well, first and foremost, when you have 580 something young people arrested in this county or uh, you know, for alleged offenses, that's really 1% of what the county's juvenile kind of population is, that 10 to 17 uh, or that 10, 17. So we have less than 1% who are actually coming in contact with, uh, with law enforcement. For me, it's taking a more strategic approach, right? When you have that 1%, uh, you know, what does that look like, right? Where, where are they most likely coming from? What times of the day are they most likely come in contact? You know, what demographics? And then having strategic interventions for that particular young person um, within that site. And, and then I guess collectively at the same time, having a robust prevention services within schools, within community. And, and hopefully we're able to do so um, with the information that we're collecting. So, so yeah, if, if I could just um, add on to that thought from David, I, I think, this conversation gets oftentimes, in my opinion, too narrowly um, defined around detention or not detention. And I think today's meeting um, is sort of an embodiment of, of, of the point that I'd like to make, which is that we need to be focusing on the entire continuum. And through the work of children's, uh, sort of the children's law policy um, and the other stakeholders that are pulling in, we need to be focused on, and, and I think this is where, you know, sometimes it's, it seems as if there's a disagreement on this, but I think everyone on this board is very focused on that early continuum to prevent um, a youth from getting further into the system. And so, you know, I think there, there has to be that investment and the county is making that investment to ensure that there's as much as we can, can possibly do in the community to prevent kids from being entangled in the law. But we also have to look at the entire continuum. And that's where I think the community, the, the community center sort of fits in that middle point. And David, I, I know you've talked and you did as well about how for certain kids, um, having some space from the environment in which they have had challenges and, you know, not several counties away, but 15 minutes away, and have it to be in a center where family is involved, where other stakeholders within Delaware County can be involved. That's, I think, this gap in the continuum that the community center really could serve. Um, and then finally, with that last piece of the continuum, it is detention. And, and as we've talked about in the past, Children are being detained by judges in Delaware County. This board has no control over that. They, they are currently, they will continue to. Our goal is to, to see that that's as, as small a number as possible. But under, you know, the current circumstances, absent a facility in Delaware County, they're being detained in Ohio. They're being detained in Western Pennsylvania in facilities that we have no direct um, control over. And so, you know, I think going forward with, you know, option three, whatever it is, I guess it's 3A, um, I think addresses, in, in, in addition to the investment we're making um, through the Center for Children's Law Policy to understand as best we can that, that early part, that intervention part um, and prevention part, that to me, I think, is the most cost-effective route um, to you know, rec recommend to county council that uh, we have architectural help to, to bring to a full design. And I'll, and I'll say, this is still in pencil, and, and to Dr. Taylor's question of, 
you know, ultimately is that, that middle point of the continuum where the community center serves. If the work that is ongoing with the Center for, center for Children's Law Policy says, no, you know, your, your intentional view is, is that you really don't need it, um, that it's best served by building, you know, two facilities in, in two different parts of, of Delaware County. You know, we wouldn't be at a shovel in the ground point for another year plus. Um, so, you know, I, I think in making the design work for both, if at some point between now and shovel in the ground, we, you know, take out the eraser and, and delete one half of the building, um, and keep only the uh, secure side. While there would be some wasted design money, um, we wouldn't be biased in that. So I, I, I think we're by making the recommendation to council to allocate the funds for this for the design work. I think we continue to sort of push things forward, which we need to do, um, but do so in a way that allows for uh, you know to not bias the work that's being done. So, so I just wanted to clarify um, to make sure that we answer Dr. Taylor's question that if this board were to decide that we have a preference for 3A, that does not negate um, some other use for the non-secure side, maybe not what we envision using it for today, and it also doesn't negate there being satellite sites in the community closer to the families that are served. So the only thing we would be deferring, if I understand correctly, is the purpose and function of that non-secure side, not its um, existence. Does well, that does that answer? Yeah, I think that does does answer. I mean, although there is the other question of the satellite sites, like there's only an infinite amount of money, and sure. so if we spend thirty nine that thirty nine million dollars on this site and then have to do satellite sites, so my proposal was just to think about efficiencies in terms of what we're doing. But I do get uh, Kevin's point of that we have a year of design. And so when the data comes back from our our partners and what I guess their research shows us we need, uh, right. we could make a turn or if we need to and decide that it needs to be closer to the community. Although, Kevin, um, one of the points that you did say was that uh, speaking to something Dave had mentioned before about it, uh, maybe being away from the community uh, could be a, a good position or a good point for some youth. But the my understanding of the non-secure side, we're not planning on having um, residential programming in the non-secure side. We're planning on having day, yeah. evening, weekend services. Um, so they won't essentially be outside of theirs, uh, their home neighborhood. They will be for certain hours of the day, but not necessarily all the time, I think is of what you're thinking. Um, but I am okay with moving forward with the way Kevin had explained it and just looking at the, the next year in terms of design and coming to a point of whether or not we are going to continue with the non-secure side in Lima or looking at putting more community-based resource centers in play. And if I, if, if I can, I just want to, I want to acknowledge a few things. I mean, first and foremost, Dr. T, you know, coming out, hearing folks and presenting that to the table, just saying, listen, I heard folks saying we want it in our community. I think it's phenomenal for me. Um, you know, I lived in the city of Chester for well over 10 years, and I know about some of the logistical issues, right? The historic uh, east first kind of west end. If we're gonna if we're gonna have a center where there isn't any really neutral space, that's gonna pose some issues as well, right? And when I when, when I talk about getting out of your environment, I, I use my own story. I use it, you know, sometimes getting out of your own neighborhood saves your life, right? And not not that you know Lyme is that. But the first time I've been around green trees and open space was, you know, uh, at Chain University, right? And that was, for me, that was life changing. And, you know, I think oftentimes, um, you know, there's a lot of studies around having having spaces in the community, but there's also a lot of data behind uh, putting a kid in a more supportive environment um, and, and, and the way that helps him as well. So um, and I also want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, if, if there is a dual purpose kind of central location, when we talk about satellite spaces, we talk about existing C3s, their current space and building their infrastructure with programming. And it, it, that isn't a capital kind of budget, right? Our Department of Human Services has funding that's geared toward programming. And it's about, again, using the data that we've collect uh, to have preventative programming uh, within these C3s, you know, 
building them up, empowering them to be able to, to address these kids in their community before they uh, c come in contact uh, with the system. And it's using the data to say who's most likely to come in contact with a system, right? What areas do they live? Uh, what, you know, all the demographics associated in having a strategic approach toward toward those young people. Yeah, I, I would just, if I could, I just would add, just kind of just echoing that for me, um, Dr. Taylor, what you're saying is, right on point as well as the opportunity to do something a little bit different and be unique. That's why we're here. Um, but I think what I'm most excited about was actually the earlier portion you know, of the presentation that, you know, number one, hearing from the community, hearing the needs of of uh, what's what's necessary right now so that we can begin to attack those challenges with our young people right now. All right. So not, you, you know, the house is going to be built when it's going to be built. But right now, young people have need. And if we can strengthen the nonprofits or the other services that are out there in, um, in a meaningful way, that's going to make the major difference in our, in our community. So, um, so I'm looking forward to more, more conversation. I know that's not what you were asking, though, Marie, but I had to say it anyway. I'm asking for whatever you want to say. OK. <laughs> Okay, so um, any other questions, comments? Yeah, question. Um, so to clarify, if we vote on option three and CCLP comes back and then we decide that we're not going to use, um, will we still be building the non secure side and using that building for something else if we decide we shouldn't have it in Lima or if we decide to do the two satellite sites or we wouldn't be building the non secure side at all in Lima? So um, I, I can, well, we're, we're actually not calling for a vote. We just want to get a sense of the room and get uh, consensus on moving forward. We're not at the point to uh, carve in stone any uh, single course of action. But as I understand it, what we're saying is um, pending finalization of the use of the space, the scale of the space, the space being the non-secure side, and uh, the design, those are a lot of pendings. But we are um, agreeing on 3A as the option with those caveats. We don't know what we're going to use it for. We don't know what the size and scale of it may, may be. And we don't know what the design of it may be, which obviously would be dictated by the function of the space. But we do concede that we need to have some non-secure portion of the building. So that's all folks are being asked to sort of and, uh, and for the record, in terms of, you know, a collective agreement, it's really just a consideration to bring it before county council uh, next month or, or, or the month after. So if folks aren't in agreement in terms of the general public, there's another opportunity to come and, and, and your voice is heard. Um, is this a, a member? Shakim. Oh, Shakima. Shakima. Great. Can you all hear me okay? I've been in transit and losing uh, sound. I, I do, to, to weigh in, I am comfortable with 3A, but I also think that Dr. Taylor's point, and I, for me, what made me more comfortable with 3A was Kevin sharing that we are going to get more information. And I just don't want to lose sight. Like we've, we've heard very strongly from the community that there are multiple needs, but we also know that the resources used and the type of money to address the different kinds of needs we heard are not always easily interchangeable. And so where I don't want us to have a conversation where we're like sort of given this impression, if we don't spend the money here, we can just move the money over here and spend it in this way because it doesn't always work out so neatly. So I do like the idea of, having some flexibility to get all of the data. Right now we're getting information about space and use and potential and cost. We also need to get information about what the commu what community assets we have that could be built from that we're going to hear from CLSP. I feel like I messed up the letters. So I think there's just a lot of information to come in and I'm comfortable with the 3A option, knowing that more information is going to come in. I just, I just want to make sure that we're all understanding that our our, our awareness can evolve as more information comes in. Correct. Any other questions? Comments? In the room? David, do you want to add anything? Much. Thank you, Mr. Reed, for all your work and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I hate to hammer away at this yet again, but we are moving forward with recommending uh, 3A pending those uh, information points that Shakima and others pointed out. Okay, um, any old business from the board? Questions, comments? Anyone online? New business, board members? I do have a question with the design committee um, and we're talking about strategic planning. I would imagine that if we're rebranding new building, new name, so we can start calling it what, what it needs to be called instead of detention center um, to have more of the strength based name um, and vision, mission and values. So we can kind of create that structure as well as that I'm imagining on the Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. I think I think once we move on from the physical space and the design of the physical space, then we'll definitely have more in-depth conversations around programming, program design, uh, and and all of those. And as always, other members of the board are invited to join those conversations. Yeah, and I think this is, this is also a great space. I think as you mentioned before, Marie, of getting the um, community's voice involved. So the their concept of a community advisory group made up of people that we've heard from and, you know, whatever that's made up, that becomes a, 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 beautiful, a beautiful task for everyone to envision together as opposed to it being just supplemented to one piece, so. Right, and, and I will say, I'm sure, David, you'll wanna add to this, that that a lot of the work, most of the work around this center will happen not in this room. Right. So um, there are a lot of other processes uh, that will be happening uh, in between meetings. Yeah, just for my point to be heard that we're breaking, if we're breaking ground, we're also not using JDC, Juvenile Detention Center. Right. Um, and that we, you know, our messaging is clear about our vision and our values, and we're calling it what it is. Right. Yeah, I think we're aligned on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, second. <laughs> Unless board members, anyone? All right, so we'll move into our second round of public comment. And again, general matters related to youth legal system. Sure. I'm Katie McGee, I'm from the uh, district attorney's office. I'm the deputy district attorney in the juvenile court. Um, my comment actually goes to the earlier presentation by the Children's Law and Policy Project. Um, it talked about pre-arrest diversion. And I wanted to bring to the panels attention and now the community because there are a lot of community members in this room about one program that my office took over last year the youth aid panel and the youth aid panel is a diversion program designed to keep juveniles between the ages of 10 and 17 who have committed low-level crimes out of the juvenile justice system affording them a second chance now prior to our office taking it up taking it over this was mostly for um district court cases like a public drunkenness or disorderly conduct. With Tanner Rouse from my office and Jack Stoltzheimer agreeing, we're trying to get in misdemeanor charges that would typically go to juvenile court, thefts, school fights, um, unauthorized use, um, different type of misdemeanor offenses that we're trying to keep out of court so we can get these juveniles the help they need. But we need help because we need the public, we need panel members. And I'm going to tell you, a panel member represents a qualified group of local community residents who serve as a counseling and advisory body for the individual cases that are brought before it. Members of the youth aid panel are volunteers, and they get a screening process done by my office to make sure they're able to serve as volunteers for the panel. Right now, we have Aston, Brookhaven, Haverford, Marple, Media, Nether Providence, Newtown Square, Pennsylvania State Police. Radnor, Spring, Springfield, and Upper Providence all have a youth aid panel. We're working to get the other police departments in this county to develop the youth aid panel, but what we need are volunteers. So I'm asking, if you go on the district attorney's website, there is a link for the youth aid panel. And if you're interested in being a, a panel member, or if you have ideas for it, please go on there and contact us because we're trying to make the diversionary program as stated, more bringing in more of the crimes um, for juvenile court and taking them out of the court system. Thank you. Thank you. Mm 
Diamond Gibbs, 39 Chatham Road in Upper Darby. Um, just wanted to make a quick comment on just the previous um, statement that came up. I feel like, of course, the areas and locations that were mentioned where the U8 panels are present, none of them are predominantly black and brown areas. And I feel like that speaks for itself. And I just wanna make clear that no, I do not and will never support this juvenile detention center coming back to the county. It has caused a lot of harm, but it feels like regardless of where the community stands on this, we're gonna proceed forward with it. So with what Mr. Arizari said, just about bringing in community organizations, community leaders, and just organ non nonprofits in general, will we actually be brought to the table when it comes to terms of who will actually be coming into the center running programs. Because the facility itself is harmful, but so is the people who are inside the facility constructing it. So if we're not gonna be brought to the table and for conversations like this, I feel like none of the community feedback that we have been given will just be valid. We already know that the community meetings that you guys have been hosting, you guys already had your plan made. It was kind of useless at this point if, again, nothing is going to be valid as far as what we're bringing to the table. So I really need to know if there will be clarification on if nonprofits, community leaders, community members in general will be brought to the table when talking about who can actually run these programs, what the programs could look like, and even what the funding will look like for that. Because we, of course, just went over what the construction will be, but that's just construction. We have to talk about salaries. Um, how much these programs will actually cost to operate and who will actually be operating them and how much that could cost too. So there's a lot that still needs to be discussed. And I just want to know if we will be a part of that conversation going forward. The answer for me is yes, but also understand this is this is government, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're part of the review panel, you don't qualify for a program, right? We can't have you reviewing yourself. Mm -hmm. You understand? So yeah, we're more than happy to have folks at the table. Uh, when we brought CCLP to the table, it was a collective decision, right? It wasn't Dave Arizari. Everybody individually scored it, right? We tallied up who scored the highest, and we'll always have that objective point of view with anything we selected. I appreciate that. It's always been a pleasure talking with you and even Jason and Tiana. I appreciate it having that conversation with you guys. So just want to say, just please keep us in the loop. The community voices deserve to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Melita Reagan. I am a parent in the William Penn School District. I have two children at Penwood High School. Um, my first comment is about the time of these meetings. I mentioned at the Darby Community Meeting, um, as well as speaking with Monica at the Chester Meeting, that 4.30 is not a convenient time for the communities that this center will impact the most. We're working class, low income families. Most people are still at work at 4.30. I'm getting my pay docked because I left work 45 minutes today to make it here. So I know you said that you had mentioned it to the board um, about maybe changing the time, making it later. Council meetings start at six for county council. If we could push it to that so people can get here, that would be great. There should be more parents in the room because we're talking about our children, right? Um, has that been addressed? Have you had time to talk to the board yet about the time changes? No, this is the first time that we've met. And okay. I mean, there is a process because they actually have to be advertised when we change the time because we've already advertised the, the schedule. And we talked about that when we spoke mm -hmm. in Chester. Yeah, I'm trying so. to get more parents out here so they have more mm -hmm. input, but they're still at work. Um, secondly, um, as always, I'm going to continue to advocate for preventative programs and resources in our schools, in our communities where our children are. Um, research and studies say that that is what is best when it comes to addressing juvenile delinquency. I understand the need for the facility, not having to ship kids across the state or into other states. I get that, but we have to talk about what are the root causes of why children get in trouble in the first place and addressing them. And studies say that you address them where the kids are, not miles and miles away from their home. It's not accessible. It doesn't make sense. And I'm sure it's gonna cost a lot of money if you're busing families and children to and from places like Upper Darby, Chester, Darby, um, all the way out to Lima. It just doesn't make sense. So we have to start talking about how we're gonna help these kids now, today, where they are in their schools and in their communities. Thank you. 
Any other public comment? Hi, good evening. My name is Ashley Giles Perkins, and I am a staff attorney at the Education Law Center. ELC is a statewide legal advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that all children in Pennsylvania have access to a quality public education. We do this work by uplifting students who are most often left out, students experiencing homelessness, black and brown students, students with disabilities, students living in poverty, especially students in the juvenile justice and foster care systems and beyond. Prior to becoming a staff attorney, I spent two years as a public interest law fellow executing a project that provided district, state, and national level advocacy and legal representation for young people situated in various residential facilities, ensuring that their access to a quality education was not lost. Placements ranged from adult jails, juvenile detention centers, residential treatment facilities, even shelters, and even hospitals. Overwhelmingly, what I found is that these placements did not offer young people with the tools necessary to rehabilitate and reform. Goals that we say on paper are in alignment with the juvenile justice system, but are often dissociated from reality. In fact, placements in these residential settings actually place youth farther away from success, from their families and supports, and farther from their goals. Particularly on education, young people placed in the wrong grade or no grade at all. Students with disabilities who behavioral plans, IEPs, and supports are ignored or not offered. English language learners or even just high school students who need world languages to graduate are unable to access quality language services. Facilities label classes math and science and make it nearly impossible for students who need to earn credits and then transfer those credits uh, to other districts. What I haven't heard and maybe is is premature is how the board will address education and graduation uh, goals with this facility if it is reopened. While time will not permit me to do so today, I leave open the opportunity to have future conversations with any board member about what I've learned and observed both through my fellowship and continue to learn about placements across the state. The last time I stood before this board, it was November, 2021 just a few months since Lima had been shuttered on an emergency motion, and the tone of the meeting was summarized multiple times as this is an opportunity to view the, this juvenile detention in a new way. The board at that time recognizing that they were both, quote, charged with putting out a fire and also looking towards long-term solutions all at the same time. Looking at the last year plus since this board, as the board continues to seek additional input, data, feedback, and weigh its options, we heard some of this data today, and I hope that we will continue to await for this important data before making any decisions. During your February meeting last month, one board member said, this is a specific task, a process that brings to light larger systemic issues. While it is not our task to address the broader view of the system, to the extent that our task is time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Andre Sims, 600 East 19th Street, just a PA. I'm so disturbed while I'm sitting here because I feel like I'm watching history repeat itself. There's a point in time where a meeting like this happened and we weren't talking about juvenile detention. We were talking about slavery. And they said, we have to disguise it, right? We got to change it. We got to use another name. So we're talking about, you know, something else. And here we are talking about prisons and juvenile detention now. Um, and so I think it's a slap in the face for to the community, to the victims of Lima, to the victims of these facilities, for you to sit there and say, we have to call it something different when everybody sitting here knows what this is. Like, you owe us that much. Just like, can, can we just acknowledge like the trauma that takes place in these facilities? Can we acknowledge that grand jury report that came out and those allegations that are now reports that have been substantiated? And can we acknowledge that nobody's been charged, but you wanna sit here and say, we're just gonna call it something else. You know, that's a slap in the face. And for us to put this carriage before the horse, you have brought CCLP in, um, and you have all this data and research, 
and we're not going to use it to make what is going to be the most important decision that we're sitting here to make. You know, we're going to take the opportunity to, oh, we're going to go for it and build this facility. And then after we build it, you give us the uh, the numbers. That doesn't add up to me. That, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I just would like us to, like, let's be frank about things. Let's just put it out there. Those community meetings were not to get community input. They were to act like, you know, we got community input it's for the perception, the same way the school building in front of the detention center that looked like Bob said was for perception. You know, we want to make it seem like we're not locking our kids up and that's fine, but let's talk about it. How are we going to talk about it? Um, and I, I know Diamond, you said that it seems like we're already going to move forward. I just want to say to, to the community, like it doesn't end here. You know, there are, I think three members of county council up for reelection. You know, our governor was actually the attorney general who prosecuted the case against Lama. There's so many senators, so many state reps who are actually on the uh, juvenile justice task force who came out with recommendations. Uh, speaking of those recommendations, who, who here read the recommendations from the juvenile justice task force? We did back there. Two, you know, three people, three people. Yeah, a couple of people from the board. This is a, a task force that was commissioned by the governor for the purpose of not making these same mistakes. And here we are moving forward, uninformed line and line to the public. Y'all, we got to start holding public officials accountable. Thank you. Any other public comment? King X, I definitely felt the uh, slap in the face. Definitely felt the slap in the face. Um, I'm trying to figure out why we're trying to sugarcoat things. Like I said, let's call it something else. That don't even make sense. Uh, me personally, uh, I agree with everybody saying we need to get to the cause and roots of things. We had a whole bunch of town halls, and it was just lie after lie after lie after lie. We need to build a detention center. That was a lie. Um, now y'all saying it was going to be a non-secure side. Now I was talking about, oh, well, we're going to put that to the side. A lie. You mean, when y'all going to stop lying to these people? When you want to stop lying to our people? When you want to stop throwing our kids in cages and trying to make it seem like they're playgrounds or they're somewhere like, I'm gonna just make a, a, a um, what can I say? Similarities, um, kidnapping. You know how kidnappers, they come to you, they say, you know, piece of candy, little kid, come get this piece of candy. That's what I got when I seen the new detention center. Piece of candy, little kid, come get this piece of candy and I'm gonna kidnap you. And I'm gonna keep you here and I'm gonna keep feeding you lies. Like I'm here trying to help you. Like I'm here trying to help my people my people well no nah. <laughs> you know i'm for this check i'm for to keep misguiding people because you know a system that claims that they're for us said it has to be done so me without having the proper courage as a man in my community i'm gonna follow that and i'm gonna lead you the wrong way that's all thank you Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Darren Laws. I'm from Chester, PA. Um, I respect and I agree with everything that everybody's saying here, but I have over 27 years experience working in the juvenile field with juveniles and adults and from Chester, PA. So um, let me let me just say this. Sometimes we got to have facilities and got to have places to save a lot of these young men and these young women that's in these streets. I'm, I'm a prime example, guy from A Street. 90% of my friends from A Street were either murdered or locked up. So when I go into prisons, you know what they say? I got a life sentence. You got to talk to these young guys. You got to make talk to them about making good decisions and choices. I'm also a, I'm a dean at Chester High School, and I know it work. I know it worked. I have the boots on the ground, not by myself, but with a lot of guys that came home 
and said, yo, we got to do something with these kids at home or have the parents crying, reaching out. And the biggest thing that I like what you guys share, resources. Resources, because not just in Chester, but look at Chichester, Derby, Upper Derby, other areas. It's really, it's really no resources down there. So Mr. Rosario, um, just working up in Philadelphia, what I did, got the resources from Philadelphia and start bringing it down here. About, I would say three weeks ago, we took a number of 30 kids on the HBC tour. All of the kids got accepted to at least five or six colleges. College ain't for everyone, but we have to have resources and we got to work together. I know it worked. I'm one of the prime guys from Chester that worked hard, not, not to get anything out of it for me, but to give people hope to know, yo, you can do it. And no, you don't have to go to college, but you could be an entrepreneur. You can reach out to people and start networking and start making good decisions and choices. Not, not to go into detail. I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Ben at Home. The Ben at Home. 80% of that crime is down. Not by me, by talking to them guys and telling them, listen, you got to make good decisions. Giving them resources, giving them hope. Because a guy like me, I didn't expect to be where I'm at and all the things that happened to me. I'm a prime example. And I'm, I'm, I'm for not just Lama, but any facility if it's going to save somebody's life. I'm for it. Talking to my students, giving them hope, talking to the parents. That, that's, that's, that's all we ask. That's all we ask. And it's not just in Chester. It's not in Chester. I have something for um, this is for you guys right here. Thank you. Uh, peace, uh, audience. My name is Kay. Um, <clears throat> it saddens me that this uh, room and group um, is having uh, discussions about um, uh, prisons uh, for young boys um, like my son. <clears throat> it saddens me that uh, a prison was closed um, for abusing children, abusing young people. Um, under the auspices of providing rehabilitation to them. Um, <clears throat> I think something that we should look at is uh, the dynamics of other communities, like Asian communities, Japanese communities, those communities um, to find out how and uh, what they invest um, 39 to $45 million on for their children. <clears throat> I'm sure they don't have a uh, round table or rectangle tables discussions about um, prisons to put their children in. <clears throat> um, I know about five organizations that could uh, come and plant trees and uh, nice greenery to uh, the African uh, community members that need to see greenery. Um, and I'm talking like fruit trees, um, just regular trees, all sorts of plants, so that uh, young young children don't have uh, to go outside. Um, and go to prison to be able to see it. Um, we have so many resources. I'm sure we could spend 45,000, I mean, sorry, 45 million, 45 million dollars um, investing um, into, uh, oh man, beyond just the education, but all of the resources, all the tools um, that is necessary, everything that you probably put in the, the center, you could probably um, offer to the homes of the, the families that would be most impacted. Um, by such a, a insidious decision. Um, I'm not sure where the children go now um, that are, you know, disrupted uh, through life's troubles, mainly the ones that uh, the systems um, that, that are created that send the very people that sit at these tables to then determine um, how we uh, crucify them at the end of their, their troubles these uh, young children that we're here to determine their lives and outcomes. Uh, but I'm sure that they would appreciate um, some money being invested into their, you know, livelihood. 
as opposed to their destruction. Um, I know it seems that prisons uh, might be helpful, the temp detention centers uh, might be helpful, but I assure you that like, you know, many of my family members have gone there. <laughs> um, many of my friends at different points in time have gone there. Um, probably some of the community members that you see have uh, have lots of experience with uh, prisons and prison systems, juvenile up to adulthood, and none of them look anything like like the glorious, beautiful things we saw today. I think we all know better. Thank you. My name is Echo Alford. Um, I live on Kingsman Road in Boothwin. My my 15 year old child is is a lifelong student of the Chichester School District. I also was you know a student of the Chichester School District. I graduated from the high school in 2003. My son is there now as a freshman. He was a straight A student his whole life um, up until last year. He started having panic attacks, and he started getting in a little bit of trouble at school because of that. Um, the first time I asked for an IEP was his to his guidance counselor in eighth grade last year. I was not told how to achieve that. I was, uh, this is also around when I started seeking therapy for my son 18 months ago. Um, I was ignored and left on my own. Of course, the, these resources didn't exist for me. Um, it's now the ninth grade. My son left the high school for, well, he almost was fully kicked out from absences from panic attacks. Um, he enrolled in a cyber charter school and now he's back at the high school because that just wasn't working, you know, it's, and all this time, you know, and then when I pulled him out of school, the second, or sorry, the first time in the ninth grade, that's the second time that I asked for an IEP and was completely ignored and not given any resources. I am begging in these administrators offices, crying with my child who is suffering from a mental illness that just came on all of a sudden, this poor kid, that was the second time I asked for an IEP and was ignored. This is a court summons for tomorrow. This is a $308 ticket because my son said the F word and raised a middle finger to the principal. That's a criminal charge and a ticket for $308 that me, a full-time worker at a nonprofit, cannot afford to pay. I'm sick of this. This is not okay. I finally got my son in therapy last week on my own after calling every place and being on every waiting list for a year and a half. And I finally got an appointment for an IEP the third time. The third time, but this was not before the cop that wrote this summons threatened to charge my child. First, he said, go to court. We just dropped the charge. But then when I started saying, how dare you do this in the first place? He threatened to not do that and continue to follow through with this charge and criminally charge my child for having a panic attack in school and being physically withheld by the principal. Not to mention the fact that that summons is full of lies. By the smug, arrogant cop who was in my son's school, criminalizing mental illness, perpetuating the school to prison pipeline. I'm not okay with this. We don't need a juvenile detention center. Put all those resources in our schools. Stop making excuses. And don't you dare not call it a juvenile detention center. Don't you look at these people in this community who suffered under Lima and do that. It's disrespectful. It's crazy. We can't do this. Do better. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Ingrid Bird, uh, 410 Walnut Hill Lane, Havertown, Pennsylvania, victim advocate. I just want to make, I just want to respond to a couple of things that I've heard. On many occasions, I've heard people ask to give some thought to the name of the facility if there is one bill, to give it some serious thought to a title, not to call it a detention center. People were talking about names, they, it's brought up and it was, they, it was said that it was premature to label it, to, not label, to give it a title. I'm, I'm standing, I, I'm not on the board, but I don't think anyone by making a suggestion that we give some real thought to the title, because the title was a Ju Delaware County Juvenile Detention Center, JDC. I don't think anyone here is suggesting that we sugarcoat it. At least that's not how I took it. And maybe that's my perspective, 
but I've been at, I've been coming here for at least 15 meetings. And on more than one occasion, members of the community have asked us to give thought to it. And I just feel like it needed to be repeated. Thank you. Other comments? Hello, my name is Diana Esposito, and I'm a resident of Delco, lifelong, uh, a parent, and the pastor of Children, Youth, and Community Engagement at Covenant United Methodist Church right here in Delaware County. I heard the board discuss today delaying the non-secure side while building the secure side. I would like the board to consider, I would like to encourage the board to consider delaying the secure facility while pro prioritizing the non-secure programming in community centers. Yeah. My family didn't have much money growing up, but because I had the privilege of living in Havertown, I had resources at my fingertips. I had therapy within blocks of my house. When I couldn't get food, there were places I could get it. And when we weren't sure what housing was gonna look like, we, we were able to get support in making sure our house could get repaired. I want what I had available to me available to all children and youth in our county. We can't have true justice in our county until we treat all children and youth the way we would treat our own children and youth. I would encourage the board to hear the community's needs and seek to prioritize front end diversion in our community today. Thank you. I'm gonna ask folks who have a public comment to come to the mic to make those comments. It makes it difficult for those of us listening to the folks at the mic to hear if you're speaking from your seats. Um, don't start your timer yet. Stockholm syndrome is real. The baby Kairu left the door, the door was locked, his anxiety heightened in a room full of strangers. Just wanted to point that out. You said this will be wellness. Well, what is wellness to you? I'm curious, very curious. When the question was asked in regards to whether or not you looked at the recommendations for the juvenile task force, you would say you said that you did not have to um, mention that. But quite frankly, the Sunshine Act is actually a law that requires state boards, legal, local, you know, folks to actually um, not omit that information. So that was actually a valid question for her to have mentioned. Um, it's crazy. So prevention, right? 44 million, whatever dollars in cost plus salary, et cetera, et cetera. We already have nonprofits. Why not provide technical assistance to the people who are already doing the work, increasing salaries for the work? People like myself, like the young woman here whose child, she works at a nonprofit, can't afford this ticket for somebody saying F you, the criminalization of mental health. I myself was a product of going to juvenile job, a juvenile facility, because call it what it is, please do a juvenile facility being released into homelessness, being released into not having support to go to college. You understand what I'm saying? And it was a hellhole to have noticed when I realized what was going on with Lima, that children, when I look back, the, the young women that I look back on were fighting some of the male staff. And it hit me that they were most likely being harassed at some point. They never put their hands on women's staff and they've always had respect for the staff. So in what ways are we going to be accountable? We're talking about prevention. And what ways are we being accountable now to trust you that you're going to be able to commit to preventative measures when you have yet to hold folks accountable for harming people? I am a sexual assault survivor and that's fucked up. Excuse my French. Y'all is crazy. The, um, sir, the, the uh, recommendation, like, you know, you went to Cheney, you seen different greenery. Um, and you know, that set and changed you. I went to Salt High School, agricultural school, um, and it, it did. But my, I myself am an all A student, have always been an all A student. You understand what I'm saying? And to have been, had to go to junior facility because I, I suffered with mental health and my mom didn't have support for me. So in what ways can we truly pour into what already exists? I do not want to hear that the recommendation of being at, you know, a college or a school like Saul, which my school needs funding, they do need funding. So please, Saul High School, please put some funding into that. Thank you. Because that definitely, you know, mm, it, it, it did some things for me. So, 
Yeah, man, the needs that we're talking about is housing. Housing, poverty, and mental health. Important to that. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment? Good evening. It's clear from, I think, the two uh, town halls that I've, I've been able to attend that there is some serious concerns for the building of this particular building. Um, it would seem to me that the vast majority of folks who I, who I saw or heard at these meetings do not want this building built, but there are other things to consider. Um, but with the time I have, um, just uh, understanding that really the prison model really doesn't work. Um, we are essentially penalizing young people for immaturity. Uh, that is sad. So with the time I have left, um, we can make the case for significantly expanding the use of diversion options that steer young people away from the juvenile justice system entirely when public safety is not at stake. Promote the transformation of juvenile probation into a focused intervention that promotes personal growth, positive behavior, change, long-time success for youth. Demonstrate this to the state and local governments can safely and significantly reduce confinement, especially for youth of color, while improving youth well-being. Support jurisdictions partnering with young people, families, and communities to develop community-based options. For youth who are not on a downward spiral, advanced principles to transform care for youth and custody, all of these things, right, uh, so that we can stop with this youth prison model. Introduce positive healing partnerships between young people, especially trained adult mentors called credible messengers who have lived through similar experience, provide technical assistance and other resources to states and counties. These are all the things that I think we can do. Um, and I've been working for young people with young people for about 30 something years. I'm in my mid fifties. I raised young uh, people, in my household. Um, some of them have uh, visited the uh, system. And what I can tell you is that uh, we really do need more resources in schools, more resources in communities. And I believe that's where money will uh, be best effective because based on every research that I've seen and read, uh, prison model doesn't work. Community-based options are more effective. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Other public comment? Hello, my name is Barbara. I just have one quick statement to say, make. For all the Black people sitting at this on part of this board, do you not understand the nature of white supremacy? Are you not afraid that your bloodline could possibly, like next generation grandchildren, will reside in these facilities? You're not afraid? You're not afraid? And I'm not talking to about white people. You are very deceitful. White people go all over the world, intoxicating nature, corrupting, pathologizing people. And you're advocating for, for prison? Y'all don't know the history of slavery? Last board meeting, somebody talked about heinous crime. The crime of the, of the youth is directly proportional to the negligence. They are the monsters you have created. You're lucky they're not coming for y'all. Let things get harder. They will become more brutal. And they are righteous. I work with young people. These young people are so traumatized, yet they come to school and they try to present their best self. They're like superhumans who are being tested beyond their limit. When a child goes and commit homicide, don't you think this child is simultaneously uh, suicidal? What kind of young people goes and kill another young person? Because they're not really killing the oppressor. They're really killing each other. They are really killing themselves. 
Don't you think that they are simul simultaneously suicidal? That means you're having a bleak existence. Huh. You white people, I don't have anything, I don't, I don't have any words for you, but it's the black people for me. It's like you're forgetting your history. You're forgetting who you are. How do you know your great grandchildren is not gonna end up in this facility that you are you for? How do you know that? You, you, you have power over, over the future that much. You don't, you don't know white supremacist changes and takes various form. Good luck. Because we re I just realized the, the public really can't change your opinion because this whole thing is about numbers, option, this, that, and the third. We do not, why can't them, somebody says we can not just flip the money into something else. Why not? If the money's here, it's money. Why can't we create hubs with different themes and, and like literature, art, music, science? Why can't we have houses that are in the hubs in the community where the youth can access them and have productive things to do instead of going and, and robbing a store for, because they're hungry and getting arrested? Like people, young people go to jail because they're robbing people because they're hungry and they're poor. Like what, what, is, what is happening to black people's psyche? Because I really don't have an argument for white people because that's a different psychology that I don't understand. But it's the black people on this board that makes me feel sick. Hi, my name is Leisha. I'm from the city of Chester. Um, I wasn't going to come up, but I couldn't sit in my seat. Um, I know we all watched the news. There was a 26-year-old woman coming from the gym and was murdered by a 15 year old boy in the middle of the night. We said not to put nobody in a facility, but what about that woman who lost her life? He's still roaming, doing him, his family see him, but that 26 year old woman, she going. Her family don't see her. They got to visit her at a grave. He may suffer from something, but they lost a loved one. I'm a mother of a son. If my child commit a crime, he got to go. He ain't got, they ain't got to come and pick him up. I'm bringing him to them because he got to go sit. Facilities are not bad. He's now 26. He went to Lama. He didn't like it. He said, oh, I ain't going back. Okay, cool. He got locked up in Philly. He went in front of Judge Reynolds. He said, your honor, on my life, the system will never see me again. He kept his word because he didn't want to be in there. The, because he said they didn't feed him right. But, but, but he come from a good foundation. He, he come from a good foundation, can we, can we, but he went, we let, he, we he went there providing public and he learned a case. lesson. I feel as though that facility taught him something that he decided not to go back. Is every facility bad? No, but some of them do save lives. I'd rather see my son that I can see him face to face and not look at no dirt or look at an urn because he was screaming. We can't blame them for a facility that's coming. It's not their fault. That's from the government. That's from bigger, but it has to be here. So the only thing, it is true. It has to be here and it's going to be here so everybody come together and work together. The problem is we can't come together and work together because we're too busy fighting. We're too busy fighting, but we're not thinking about people who are committing crimes and they just getting slaps on the wrist and then they get worse and worse and worse. So where they go back home? But what about the victim? So they just got to sit there and be like, oh, they get to walk past. What about that grandfather? Them kids beat him with a cone. Two of them walk in the streets. And they were juveniles. No, they need to be put away because they need help. And the parents need help too because they can't do it alone. I'm sorry, but we, we need a facility because it may save their life. Everything not bad. Thank you. Any other public comments? Mary Tanita Austin, Media PA. Um, I was really speechless. I mean, I came and made comment before um, the rest of the conversation. Um, I want to one say there is no law that says we have to have a facility. Um, and two, as a parent, 
Um, I'm just glad I love myself enough to not want my child being cared for or harmed by anyone else. Um, and so, you know, I'm disturbed. I'm a little confused. I know you decide whether you want to answer questions or not um, about whether you're going to present this to county council after you get the findings in December um, from the people that you've commissioned to give you information, or if you're presenting it before you get that information. I'm really confused about the conversation that happened here because as someone else said, it just really does not, process does not make sense to me at all. And I've been here from the beginning um, saying the same things. And uh, I, I'm sorry for the youth who are not being heard. I'm sorry for the youth that are gonna end up in this place um, of horrors that there's no way that you can put a pretty bow around it. I've visited youth in George W. Hill who are not getting educated, um, who are being abused by officers and the officers were fired, um, pepper sprayed. You know, they're in our care too, or in your care too. And so to, to trust this county with our young people when there is no record of you being successful at it, I don't know how you can expect the community to do it. And this is just a percentage of the community that's outraged. You will hear from the community about this. We're not done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I hear a lot behind me. Take the mic. This time is for you. Board member comment. Board member comment, please. Comment, I heard a lot of passionate input. So I would like an update if um, if Deputy McGee would be able to provide that to us, maybe through you, David, next meeting about how many people took advantage of the opportunity to interview for the youth panel um, diversionary program, um, because I, I see a strength in this room of a lot of passionate people. So if Deputy McGee would give us a report, I would appreciate that. It's not. No, Deputy McGee gave a full report, and I'm sure she'd be willing to talk to you. Yeah, so I encourage folks to talk to the folks who are running the youth aid panels to get that detail from them. I'm not sure that the, the board didn't present the information, so we're not in a position to I'm give you the detail that you see. Looking for an update, since okay. she was gracious Great. enough to be able to provide a report. Are they able to provide like, the numbers for like how much? I don't know who they is. Do you want to take the mic so you can ask a question that we oh, may be oh, able to answer? Take the mic. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, I, I see uh, that um, it was listed about how much uh, this facility um, needs to be like built. Um, I'm not specifically sure if you guys have done the data on how much it will take to maintain. And then, of course, what like the profits are because everybody knows that, you know, you know, folks got to get paid. And so how much, like, you know, what's the yes. the expected income for this, this type of project? I think we can provide you information about the financing regarding the center that does not yet exist when we have it. Board member comments? So um, I, I do like, have one other comment. I was wondering, okay, we have a solicitor here. Um, it's an allegation to indicate that any one of these board members here are in any violation of any regulation. And so as a board member who's volunteering her time, I would like our solicitor to explain what the Sunshine Act is, um, because it was a heavy accusation that uh, was violated this evening. And I was hoping that you could provide some information. What was the alleged violation? That because a uh, question that was directed to individual board members was not answered by individual board members um, about their own actions, if they reviewed and how extensively they reviewed the justice reform report that we were in violation or one individual myself was in violation of the Sunshine Act. And that was during public comment. There is no requirement 
uh, for the individual board members to respond publicly uh, to those questions uh, during public comment. That Thank is you. not a violation of the Sunshine Act. Thank you. I do have, uh, go ahead. Two comments. Um, first, uh, to, to your comment about the, uh, the financing, we'll, we'll come eventually at some point in time with the budget plan, but it's a, it's a government organization. So there is no profit to be made off of anyone. All the dollars are funded through government agencies and all of it comes out of our, it's not a, it's not a for-profit entity um, essentially. And so I understand what you're modeling after the previous George W. Hill prison used to be a for-profit model because it was run by a for-profit agency. Uh, that is not a government model um, in how, we function in our finances. Um, the other piece, uh, the young lady who came up, I don't know if she's still here or not. I would like us to consider for next meeting to think about um, our time of our meeting and what that would require in terms of uh, previous, like what we need to go through in terms of setting the times and what type of public notice, public notice yeah. and how, what the timing around that process would look like for next meeting. Thank you. Not for so, the meeting to be later next meeting, but for us to talk about it next meeting and then be able to do the proper public notice going forward. Got it. So um, I want to I want to close out with a statement because I think uh, board members meeting after meeting, we provide this time, we listen to the comments, to the passion, to the feeling, to the accusations, to the personal attacks, and um, and we take it all in. But for those of you who came with a positive purpose to contribute and give uh, feedback, I, you know, I thank you for taking the time uh, to weigh in on the work of the Juvenile Detention Board um, and particularly on the planned new facility. I think your work as community members broadly and as advocates is vital to hold the county's youth legal system and those of us who volunteer on this board accountable. I really do believe that. I believe many of you are doing this with righteous intent and that your work is much needed. We spend a lot of time in these meetings hearing about the ways in which you differ with those of us who serve on the board and with the youth legal system in general. I just wanna say a few words about that, but also about how I believe we're actually aligned. Some of, the, some of us on this board believe as you do that carceral systems as we know them have rarely provided the solutions that young people, families, and communities need. Some of us also believe that when young people come into conflict with the law, they should not enter systems that are as punishing as the lives that they led that led them to become system involved in the first place. I know that we all believe on this board that when a young person is removed from society, they should return better off than they left. And we further think, as many of you have expressed, that there are far too few resources in communities to respond when a young person who acts out because of mental health issues a lack of access to pro-social activities, a lack of a functional family system, and sometimes just because of simple poverty should have more resources. About those things, I think there's little disagreement unless you're determined to disagree. So here's where we may disagree. Until we assess the needs and can be assured that they can be safely met in the community, we have to take into account, and yes, sometimes remove from the community a small subset of young people who may cause harm to themselves and others. We can agree to disagree on that. Currently, in the absence of a place to safely house, yes, that is a law, to safely house and treat our young people, please don't interrupt me, I did not interrupt you. In the absence of a place to safely house and treat our young people in Delaware County, we have to send them currently to places as far away as Ohio, surrendering their care to systems and people we do not control and about whom we have limited information. 
in doing so, I think everybody will acknowledge we also create distance between those young people and whatever social supports, family, and friend groups they rely on. But to be clear, these children and young people are detained not by the order of the Juvenile Detention Board of Managers, but by the juvenile court exercising their lawful discretion. And this board, for the hundredth time, has no power to change that. But as one of you pointed out, you certainly do. You can go to Harrisburg. You can go to county council. You can vote out judges who do not act according to community values. We as a body on this board, and certainly each of us individually, have made a choice to serve on this board without recompense, some of us leaving work early, just as many of you have, to reimagine and then realize a way to interrupt the cycle of delinquency and crime that some young people have become involved in. Most of us, I promise you, would far prefer not to provide that interruption through incarceration, but for some young people, they do exist, and I wager you know that they do. Detention means that all other efforts and interventions have failed. For some young people, it means that those things have failed. What we're doing here at this table and what we continue to say is that we are inviting you to co-create a better way. No one argues that juvenile detention in the United States and certainly in Delaware County was broken. We're inviting you to co-create a new way. Conversation is not compromise, but all too often when we come into these rooms with community members, many, many of you are inclined to make it, make it clear that there is no conversation to be had. For those folks, we'll continue to entertain those comments, but for those who want to co-create something better, the door remains open or email addresses are public, David Irizarry gives out his cell phone number like it's candy. And there was yet another option presented to you tonight about the youth aid panels. So for those of you who are interested in co-creation, we are here to do that with you in as transparent a fashion as we can. Those of you who want to complain, we're grownups. We can take it, come back, complain some more but the smaller subset of you who wanna be a part of the solution, we certainly invite you to whatever tables we're gonna be setting. Any other comments from board members? Yeah, I just, if I can just, and that was, thank you for saying that because you took 95% of what I was gonna say. Uh, but I do, want, I do want to offer a different position and a different position, as a young lady mentioned about slavery, which I have studied and have been not only here, but around the world, from Haiti to Liberia, to South Africa, to Ghana. And one of the things I see different in those countries with people who look like us is that they take the responsibility within their own community to make a difference in their community. And so what I'm saying is this, the power is not at this table. The power is with what we do in our community. We stop our young men and our young women from ever coming anywhere near the system. We do that as a people in our own community. It is not the judicial system. It is not the people on this board. It's not even the judges. It is we who do that. And so I encourage you, as I have in every meeting, rally together, find solutions in our community, find out what our young people need and begin to meet the needs. Do not wait, and I'm gonna use your term, not your, not you, I'm not looking at you, I'm just looking in general. I'm gonna use the term this, I'm gonna use the term this way. Uh, please excuse my French. But if, when you're sitting around waiting for somebody else to make sure that your bed is made, then you, are ha you have already drunk the Kool-Aid and you are in, 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 engulfed in the system the way that it is, because it is the it is the system of entitlement that creates the opportunity for this kind of thing to continue to happen. And if you want to stop entitlement, then you have to rise up. We, not just you, we together have to rise up and not put it on somebody else, but take responsibility. 
in our own community. The work I do in the city of Chester, I make sure that young men and women that are around me are not ever part of this system. How do we give you the 45 million? I don't need the 45 million. You know what I need? I need I need people like you. I need people like you to be there to talk real to the people in my community. That's what I need. That don't cost a dime. So what you say here is wonderful, but what I want to know the next time you come, I want to know how many young people you've helped since the last time you came to this meeting. Okay? So when you get up to when you get up to talk next time, you tell me I've helped 20 young people in my community and bring them with you. Thank you. Any other any other board member comments? Any other board member comments? Response. Controlling whether or not we get to say anything back and forth. It looks like we, we want to have a back and forth. I don't want no. But, but you I, have I'll meetings. invite. I'll, I'm going to invite talk. folks. I'm going to invite folks. Well, well, I'll answer the question. I think there are ample opportunities and forums for conversation. Okay. We continue to create them. The community meetings, when they're held, are posted publicly if you would like an individual outreach so that you know when it's happening, I'm sure Mr. Irizarry will provide that for you. Unfortunately, as it stands, this is not a forum for back and forth. We would never get through the business of the board if we were to entertain every comment. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still speaking. I'm sorry, if you know, we can't have a conversation if one person's being yelled at and-, and I, I, I'm not sure you do, but let's ask if there are any other board member comments. Are there any other board member comments? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. We're out. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Uh, Claire, who's Savannah Matthews that was on?